Welcome to the Dental Implant Practices Podcast, where each episode will explore how to integrate dental implants into your practice and into bone with your host, Dr. Philip Gordon. Welcome back to another episode of the Dental Implant Practices Podcast. I'm your host, Philip Gordon, and today I've got a great guest with you. It's Dr. Dan Holtzclaw. Uh, Dan, thanks for being on the show and thanks for taking some time to talk with me. Yeah, thanks for having me on. You know, I, I became, a view, uh, became aware of you through some social media stuff and have followed your work for a while. And I just want to say on the record that I'm a, I'm a big fan of your work. I think you're a fantastic surgeon and uh, you document things real well. You're a great teacher and it's, it's finally nice to hear from you. Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate that very much. So I know you're down in Austin, Texas, um, uh, and I'm in Kansas City, so we're at least we're in the same time zone and uh, relatively, you know, bigger metros. I know Kansas City is probably quite a bit bigger than Austin, but, you know, they're both good sized towns and we are um, we're not going to get into too much COVID stuff because that's not what I want to talk about. But things are definitely interesting as far as, you know, what we can and can't do in surgery and uh, uh, dentistry these days. But I still love implant um, implant uh dentistry because you know it's still a need that people want even if they're not getting um small things or routine cleanings at times like people want implants and so you know we uh we have the blessing to continue on working and helping pe- people's lives so um that's that's definitely a great thing but i want to start with your story i want to hear um you know dan how you kind of got into dentistry how you went through dental school how you went through your your specialty program and then we'll kind of bring it up to speed with you know what you're doing down there in austin as far as um, what your job looks like and in uh, your work days? Well, when I, uh, you know, when I started college, I originally wanted to go to, to medical school. And I was in this, uh, I had two roommates. And, uh, you know, we had this group of us and, you know, all of us were same major studying to go to medical school. And, you know, it got really competitive to the point where, you know, uh, our roommates, we wouldn't even study with each other. You know, I'd find one of my roommates would be sneaking off to, volunteer somewhere and then you ask him you know hey where where were you all day and then he's like oh i was volunteering over here and this is kind of crazy because you know everybody wanted to get ahead and so i started talking to a friend of mine and uh i was telling him this and he says well why don't you think about dentistry i've got this friend he got into dental school he hooked me up with a local dentist to observe and i i went and observed and i said okay this looks pretty good and uh, Looked into it, and, you know, so decided that, uh, you know, I'd go to dental school. So I changed my major and uh, got away from some of that craziness that I was having with uh, this other group that I was with uh, in terms of trying to compete for medical school. And dental school is still, you know, competitive, but it just didn't seem to have that same vibe that all these people competing for medical school did. So I got to dental school and that uh went well and i was a little u- unique because uh we actually uh, my wife and i got married in college so we already married in dental school and we had our first kid in dental school and uh so when i graduated uh i joined the navy uh i actually joined while i was in dental school and so uh went off in the navy we already had kids and I did a GPR my first year. And in that GPR, you know, we were basically the stunt monkeys for the oral surgery residents that first year. And uh, uh, it, was a, it was a pretty uh, toxic residency where I was. The, you know, uh, the, the residents, uh, you know, kind of took a beating. And... Uh, we had, you know, a young baby at that time, and she had been born, uh, you know, prematurely, so she had some health issues, and, you know, we were on call every three nights, and so when I was a GPR resident, you know, I saw the oral surgery lifestyle, and at that point in time, I didn't think it would be really conducive to our family with, uh, you know, having a, a, a child that was had some health issues. And so uh, that kind of turned me off wanting to do an oral surgery residency. So after I finished my GPR, uh, I got shipped out to Hawaii for three years in the Navy. And uh, I did general dentistry work for three years out there. And uh, I was still very interested in surgery. And 
uh, I uh, still gave oral surgery some consideration, but I remembered the uh, the time commitment uh, for the the residency, and we had a second child out in Hawaii. And uh, you know, long story short, I ended up meeting uh, a friend out there who was a periodontist, and uh, so I started doing some work in the periodontal department out in Hawaii, and uh, I liked it. You know, I got to do surgery, and the you know the residency was not quite as uh, time consuming as the oral surgery residency, which was going to work a little bit better with what I had going on at the time family wise. And so I ended up going to perio residency. And so I did that through the Navy. And, uh, so after finishing that, uh, I did perio, uh, down in, uh, Pensacola, Florida for the Navy. I was the periodontist for the blue angels. And uh, I was the only periodontist in the the entire Gulf Coast. So I covered from Pensacola, Florida to uh, uh, New Orleans. And so it was a great experience. You know, I got to do tons of different work. And, um, you know, that's where I got exposure to a lot of different types of surgical treatments. I had a lot of good mentors, uh, periodontists, oral surgeons. And uh, you got to really make, you know, what you wanted out of it. So, you know, I worked really hard and tried lots of different techniques and procedures. And so when I uh, got out of the military, I had been in for a total of almost 13 years at that point. And, you know, again, that was more of a family issue. You know, the military, you have to move around every three years. And as my kids got older, you know, it was getting harder for them to basically start over again every time we moved and so I didn't want them to have to keep doing that so we got out and at that point most of my family had moved to the Austin Texas area and so I ended up moving to Austin Texas and uh, when I got there I bought a perio practice and it was a traditional perio practice and uh, just in the course of practicing I was I was doing full arch cases, uh, not tons of them, but was doing more and more and you know, really enjoyed those. And, uh, you know, at one point made a decision that this is something that we'd like to pursue for, uh, further. And so I ended up you know, leaving the periodontal practice uh, behind and basically starting a, an implant practice from scratch and then over the course of time built that up into a full arch implant practice which was uh, you know the long-term goal and you know I never thought we'd get to a point where arches every day and that's you know as time has gone on that's basically where we've gotten to Um, you know we we still do some single implants but you know really that's a very small part of the office now and you know as we had the full arch practice you know that even evolved and changed over time to where a good portion of our practice now are more advanced full arch cases uh, with zygomatic implants pterygoid implants bomer implants um, and I'd say probably at least at least probably a third of our cases now, uh, maybe more even, are zygomatics and pterygoids, and, um, but all full arch cases. And so as, as the practice has evolved to that, you know, we have our own laboratory and our own lab technicians. And, um, you know, we've, uh, you know, got to a point where, you know, this is uh, what we do. So we do full arch and I'd say we focus more even on the uh, more difficult full arch cases. And uh, that's uh, basically the daily life at our office now. Yeah, excellent. You know, that's um, you've uh, you've had quite a bit of uh, involvement with, you know, different parts of dentistry. You know, you kind of went full circle with your uh, training and then you went, uh, you know, with the military, then you, you come, come full circle with your training as far as implants. Um, how was it that you were able to make that shift from, 
when you open your own practice from kind of single to occasional full arch to full arch all the time, was there something that really helped with that? Or was it just kind of, you know, learning about your area and learning about your trade and work getting out? How, how does somebody make that transition to, to mostly just full arch? Well, you know, pretty much most of this I've done on my own. You know, there's some courses out there, um, you know, and I had went to a handful of courses and some of them are better than others. You know, some courses, uh, unfortunately I went to turned into basically giant infomercials for guided surgery cases. Um, you know, other courses there, you're working on a model and you know, you're not going to really learn anything that way. Um, and so, uh, a lot of it was just doing it and, you know, I had you know a lot of surgery experience, and you know, just the more you do, the more you learn. And you know, on the prosthetic side, which I think there's even fewer uh, learning opportunities on that. Uh, you know, that was all just experience, and you know, you just run into situations that aren't in any textbook, and they're uh, not. You know, there's no articles on them and you just have to problem solve. And what's nice now is with, you know, so much social media that we have, you know, there are a lot of uh, clinicians that will post things uh, that teach and show. And, you know, that's where, you know, I, I try to put quite a bit on the social media to help others that are interested in doing this kind of work, because many times you can't find that information anywhere and uh social media has been nice because it has you know allowed me to connect with uh, you know other clinicians in you know various parts of the world that you know have similar uh practices similar backgrounds and it's you know, someone that you could talk to whereas in the past you know, many times you didn't have somebody like that that you could talk to because they just didn't understand what you did at your office on a daily basis. Because, uh, for example, if I'll talk to a lot of doctors and, you know, they may have done an arch or two before, but so they think they know everything about full arch and they don't even know what they don't know because there's so much stuff that could go on with the full arch that uh, they, they just haven't seen some of these scenarios because you just have they just haven't done enough of them and so sometimes it's hard to talk to people about that because they really don't know what you're talking about sure no it's 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 definitely a complicated uh series to learn these uh techniques and then at at what point did you decide to bring in your own lab because i think you know my office did that uh about six months ago and i and now i just uh i could never go back so at, at what point did you know that that was going to be important for you? And, and how has that experience been for you? Has it been a, like the best thing you've ever done or the worst thing you've ever done? Um, probably a little bit of both, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, we were, we were getting, you know, we've run into scenarios where certain labs are better than other labs. And then you know, so we got some, sometimes we'd get some lab work back that was not so good. And uh, just because a lab, could do implant work, you know, didn't necessarily mean they could do full arch work. And then, uh, and then certain other labs, just the, the turnaround times were, you know, uh, just not really acceptable. And, uh, you know, so eventually we really started doing our own lab work. So we'd have a bit more control of what we were doing. And, um, you know, that's its own uh, challenge uh, in itself, you know, running running the lab portion um, because you have technicians, you have uh, you know, new techniques, you have new software, new materials. Uh, you know, so that's, you know, very difficult to keep up with everything. But it obviously has its advantages as well, you know. Yeah, no, I think I think the control part and then the the time for turnaround and then the um, I I just find that that having the uh, lab technician there in front of the patient's been a huge 
you know, uh, positive note that I never thought about. You know, the, the communication between patient, dentist, and lab tech can really be, uh, you know, at 100% with, with your own lab uh, on site that they can see the patients and work with the doctor as a team approach. I've, I've found that that's been a, a major benefit. Yeah, definitely. As far as uh, most of the cases you're doing nowadays, um, a, a lot of them involve, like you said, the zygomatics and the, and the pterygoids. Um, I know you also work pretty closely with um, uh, Norris Medical. Why, why don't you tell me about um, some of the stuff you're doing with them and, and why um, why those products are working for you? I mean, why is it that uh, Norris, you know, has such a good implant and, and the zygomatic process with that? Kind of kind of walk me through that because I know, um, you know, I know what zygomatic implants are, but I've, I've never placed them and my familiarity with the process is um, somewhat limited based because of that. Well, I have... Uh... You know, there's not a ton of zygomatic implants on the market, and we actually started our zygomatic journey with a different brand. And, uh, you know, I'd seen the Norris brand basically through social media, and the design to me really made a lot of sense. And so we basically contacted them on our own and asked for a you know, demonstration of the products, and, uh, and then we used them. And and using them compared to some of the other systems that we used, it was uh, literally a night and day difference in the performance and the, the ease of use and the predictability. And, you know, the, the Norris design is a, a primarily an extra sinus technique. And so uh, I just found that style to be uh, much more predictable, uh, less post-operative complications. Um, uh, very, I, I found easy to work in my hands, um, and uh, you know, it, it, my journey to using zygomatics and pterygoids. I actually did pterygoids before zygomatics, and you know, there's probably many fewer people that do pterygoids than zygomatics, and uh, you know, I started doing those out of necessity because doing these types of cases every day, you start to see a lot of scenarios where you, know, you need more bone, you need harder bone, you need more support. And um, these types of implants really open the door for a whole nother world of patients. And, uh, you know, so to be quite honest, in doing the pterygoids, you know, there's, there's no courses on those. Uh, you know, the, even the literature on them is, pretty sparse. And uh, so I just basically did a, a ton of, you know, lit search reading. You know, I've been the editor in chief of an implant journal for 10 years, uh, 12 years at this point. So I was you know, pretty well versed in lit. And so uh, to do these, I literally researched everything. I looked at oral surgery lit, implant lit, you know, ENT literature. Um, a lot of the literature I read was actually on Lafort surgery uh, because a lot of the anatomy is uh, all very pertinent to doing pterygoid implants. And, you know, the very first one I did, I just did it. You know, I'd never seen one. I'd never watched anyone do one. Uh, and, yeah, I just knew the the lit, I knew the anatomy and the, uh, you know, everything worked. And as I, you know, have done more of these, more of these, you know, I've refined my process to where I can have my own way of doing it. And, uh, you know, because of that uh, experience, I've actually written a pterygoid textbook that should be published at the end of the summer. Uh, it's about 225 pages, hardback, uh, color textbook and uh, you know so I've put all that information together and uh, if anyone's interested in learning about that it's at pterygoidimplantbook.com but um, so in doing the pterygoid then I moved over and started doing zygomatics and uh, you know for the zygomatics uh, it went to uh, uh, basically a, a couple of single day courses to see how they're done. And then uh, I've got a colleague uh, in the office with me, uh, Juan Gonzalez, who's an oral surgeon. And then 
we just start doing them. And as we've you know done more and more of them, you know, we've refined our technique, and now we've come up with our own technique that we use, and uh, just refined that over the years. And in doing so, we've found that you know we really like the design of the Norris Medical implant, you know, the uh, extra sinus technique with the smooth body, uh, so you're not getting any you know, pathogen adherence to that, uh, extra sinusly, uh, you know, the thread design, you get really high amounts of torque. Uh, also, you know, they have a wider variety of butt mix. You know, it goes from zero, 17, 30, 45, 52, 60. So you have uh, a huge variety of, of butt mix to choose from where as, you know, with some of the other systems, you, you don't, you don't have that variety of abutment. Uh, selection. And, you know, depending on the angle of the zygoma, depending on the angle of the pterygoid, you know, you're going to need, you know, some different angulations at times. And having those extra abutments is certainly helpful and lets you get a lot better screw access hole position. And um, so as we've done more of these cases, um, you know, we have attracted more of those cases because, you know, these patients go tell their friends, people see, you know, social media posts about it, or they see a TV commercial about it. And so now that's what we tend to see a lot more of are these people that have severe amounts of bone loss that have been told they can't get any implants done. You know, they don't have enough bone. Um, And, you know, like today, I think uh, that was the bulk of our consultations were just all, you know, uh, quad zygos and regular zygos and, and pterygoid cases, um, you know, re- no standard cases. That's basically what they all were, were these harder, uh, you know, more severe bone loss cases. Yeah. You know, and I think, I think we're going to be seeing more and more of those. Um, you know, there's, there's always a, a group of people that have their teeth taken out a long time ago and have just, you know, been in dentures, uh, for forever. And then I think we're also going to be looking at, you know, at some point a wave of, uh, you know, all on four failures that are coming in with, you know, we're going to need some rescues for these cases. And so, uh, I think, I think mastering these techniques is great. I'm glad you're putting together such an awesome book to do that. I went to the, uh, the website there that you were talking about and it's, it looks amazing. Uh, the stuff you're doing. I think even if you're not necessarily doing pterygoid or zygos yet, um, those are things, you know, a good surgeon needs to know anyway. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's definitely a, a, a fascinating uh, part of implant dentistry because it's, um, like you said, there's definitely a need for it, but there's not a lot of people doing it. Um, and that's that's always a right. good place to be when you can do something that not a lot of people can. Right. And it's good because you, it also allows you to, uh, you know, if you're doing these types of cases, uh, like you said, you know, as time goes on, you're going to see complications, you're going to see possibly failures of things and being able to uh, have treatments that you can fix those situations um, is, is invaluable because uh, one, if you could take care of it yourself, that's great. And two, if you can fix problems, you know, that other people can't, then that, you know, certainly opens uh, a new world of uh, patients for you to treat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, as far as um, the regular implants for Tough uh, or Norris, do you, do, you, do you have you experienced much with the Tough Pro or why do you like the Norris medical line? Is it the um, aggressive threads and uh, some of the machining collars or what is it about uh, this implant line that really works in your hands? I know um, I've seen it before. I know some of my friends have used it, and it, it looks like a great implant. Is it is it the flexibility, the prosthetics, or uh, or is it just because they they have the zygomatic process, and you're doing a lot of those? But um, what is it specifically you like in a dental implant? Uh, well, that's how I originally began using uh, that particular system was uh, because of the zygomatics and the pterygoids, and that then brought me into using their you know standard, I guess, if you call it implant system for, you know, regular implants. Um, and, you know, for us at this point, uh, single implants are, believe it or not, a, a fairly small component of the practice, but, uh, you know, we certainly still do them. And, uh, you know, the, the Norris line of implants 
you know, the tough, the tough pro, the tough TT, uh, you know, we use all of them and they, they, I like them because when they have, uh, you know, an aggressive end cutting thread, which I like in all of the implants that I use, uh, to, they have a universal platform. So whether you're using a 3.3 or a 3.75 or a, you know, 4.2 or a 5 or a 6, you use the same, you know, abutment it's one size that fits all the platforms so that's nice because you're not having to buy you know with some of the other systems that we had in the past you had to buy you know narrow platform you know regular platform wide platform you had to have you know three sets of abutments you had to have you know three sets of everything and you know with this it's, it's nice because you have just one set and the you know so that's you know more cost effective it's easier to keep track of uh, easier inventory wise um, the, you know, the drill system's easy to use, uh, you know, the abutment selection is bigger. Um, also just certain things they have, I haven't seen with some of the other systems, like, uh, for example, on a, you know, on the ratchet driver, there's a, a 45 millimeter driver, which I haven't really seen with some of the other systems. And you may say, well, why would you need a 45 millimeter driver? And, you know, it actually comes in they're great for paragoid implants, you know, but they have, I think like, I don't know, four or five different lengths of drivers. So you got, you know, really short ones, you know, regular length, long, extra long, super duper long. And, uh, it just seems that, uh, there's a bigger variety of things to choose from, uh, for different scenarios than with certain other systems. Um, and the implants work well and, you know, I get good torque with them and, and they're, you know, predictable and, um, and, you know, so they do what we need them to do. And also the, the cost is, uh, they're very cost effective. You know, some of the implant systems out there, uh, are, you know, very proud of themselves in terms of cost. And, uh, you know, it's not that those implants heal any faster or do anything better um you know they may be they have a better party at the uh yearly conference that you go to <laughs> or something but you know because some of uh, you know some of the implant prices out there are you know crazy compared to certain other systems and uh you know but uh norris has been very uh cost effective and uh and has worked very well for everything that we've needed to to do yeah excellent uh what's in your future here this next year if uh if things ever get back to normal is that something that looks like uh how much teaching do you uh would you normally do you know in a year and in, in lecturing and you know and then what what academies do you like to belong to and kind of what's your circles of influence i know everybody's kind of got their own niches i mean uh do you go back to um you know, the, the American Academy of Periodontology meetings, do you like um, some of the AAID or ICY meetings? And then, uh, you know, what's, uh, what's, what's a year look like for you? Are you, are you teaching, uh, you know, a lot or writing more publications? What, what's the rest of a normal year look like for you? Well, like last year, for example, I, I did quite a bit of traveling. I, I'd say it seemed like every month I was going somewhere and I was, I think last year it was in Brazil and South Africa and um, Hawaii. And I don't even, I can't even remember all the places. There was just a whole bunch of places um, giving lectures. Um, and um, I, you know, I have had a lot of requests for uh, pterygoid courses, uh, Zygo course. So we're putting one of those together uh, in combination with Norris. And so, uh, you know, COVID kind of put a big uh, damper on that, uh, you know, because it's limited travel quite a bit. And so once we get past, you know, the, the COVID crisis here, then uh, we'll be able to move forward with that uh, a bit more aggressively. Uh, in terms of meetings, I like uh, I like the uh, Academy of Osseo Integration meeting. Uh, I like uh, the AAID meetings. Uh, I've I think I've lectured at that one for, gosh, I don't know, quite a few years. Uh, I, I usually end up going to the meetings that I'm lecturing at. 
Uh, it's like the AO, the AAP, the AEID, um, the uh, ADSA, the, the anesthesia meeting is a great meeting. Um, and then uh, lots of little local societies. But um, uh, this year, uh, you know, until all the COVID stuff's done, uh, I guess all that's pretty much on hold. That's one of the reasons I was able to finish this book, you know, much faster is because you know the office was shut down for you know six weeks or however long it was so i just pretty much was working on that thing every day and um uh you know now that we're able to get back to work um you know to be honest with you i have to even look and see what meetings are still open (laughs) you know because there were so many that were canceled and postponed and changed and, and now with this you know, it seems like second wave coming up. I don't know if they're going to change any of that or because I know it's quite a big endeavor to get these meetings planned. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't know what the, the rest of the year is going to look like, but it's, uh, that's why I was kind of asking like, you know, what is, what would 19 look like? I know everyone's in a different state right now. And I know, yeah, I mean, you know, who knows what like next, to- what next month will look like at this point. So it's just kind of day by day and, uh, pray for, yeah, I mean, pray really for everyone is. to be healthy. It- yeah, it literally is. It's kind of, you know, week by week, day by day, and, uh, you know, just uh, kind of doing what we can do and, and keeping an eye out on the media and with our dental society and the state and seeing, you know, what's happening and if there's any new restrictions or, um, you know, so it's kind of always in the back of your mind, uh, hoping that you know, things are going to keep getting better and not regress. But, you know, I think right now it's still seems like it's very much up in the air, you know, whether it's going to go one way or the other. Well, yeah, you know, I know, um, you know, like you said, this, this time gave you a little bit of time to work on the, on the book and I'm sure that's going to be amazing. Uh, I'm sure when um, things stabilize, whenever that is, I, I know your, your courses are going to be in high demand. So, uh, yeah, I, I'd love for you to, you know, update everybody on social media and, and I can update the, the group and the podcast as well about, uh, when your book comes out and when teaching, uh, courses come back out. Cause I know, you know, the things you're doing are really impressive and I think you've got a great thing going and I know others, uh, want to follow in your footsteps and leadership. And, and so, uh, greatly appreciate all the work you're doing, uh, posting cases, writing books, teaching others and sharing your information. And, um, you know, can't say enough about those awesome things you're doing and, and uh, you know, wish you the best of luck here the rest of the summer. So it's uh, as we wrap up here, what kind of courses do you see yourself putting on in the future? And, and, and if somebody wanted to take those kind of how how that how would they best do that at some point? And then let's review uh, the book again, just so because uh, I know people are going to want to learn more from you, Dan. How can they do that? So just kind of keep everyone posted on what. Um, that looks like and, and where they should go for those updates and, um, you know, how to, how to learn more about you. Sure. Well, uh, basically what we talked about doing would be smaller, uh, small courses where literally be one to two students at a time, uh, be just, uh, basically somebody coming into the office, um, watching a handful of cases and, and we've, you know, already been doing this. Uh, we've had, we just recently had, uh, uh, a colleague traveled down from uh, Michigan and spent a day in the office uh, watching uh, pterygoid and zygo cases. And, you know, this particular person was actually most interested in learning pterygoids. And so uh, they got to see a number of pterygoid cases and, uh, and then basically, uh, you know, a lot of one-on-one time where, you know, we sit down and uh, review some, you know, older cases, review, uh, you know, lectures, uh, and then, you know, just get time one-on-one to, you know, ask questions and have their questions answered. And, you know, it was interesting because, you know, uh, this person that had come down to watch us this most recent time, you know, had done some of these uh, types of implants before and said, you know, their success rate on them was not that great but that after watching how you know i was doing them you know said some of the it was just some of the little things that he picked up on uh were 
what helped him uh, and like how fast or slow we were running the drill um, you know some of the angles that we were using um, you know a lot of uh, a suturing technique you know I do a particular suturing technique and um, so he said you know when he went back home he uh, had a couple of cases that he actually reviewed with me on his computer. So he brought down and showed me some of the CAT scans and said, okay, when I go back home, I have, you know, these three cases coming up. So we went through them and, uh, you know, pointed out a few things. And then he did his first case and, you know, it, he said it was perfect. And then, you know, it was really the first time he felt really confident in being able to do that particular type of implant and that it, you know, worked great. And he just basically was utilizing some of the techniques that he saw we were using in the clinic. And, uh, he said, you know, just those small things, uh, you know, helped him out tremendously and just having the one-on-one time to pick, you know, somebody's brain, it can help tremendously because, you know, I've been to courses where, you know, there's, you know, 25, you know, people that show up for the course you know, and they give you a lecture and you get to watch them do a case, but you don't really get a chance to interact with them much or see little tiny details because, you know, there's 20, 25 other people watching and you can't get close enough to see exactly some of the small things that they're doing, or you don't have, you know, all night to sit there and talk with them and ask them questions. And so I think that's where, you know, what we would be doing would be a little different because, you know, we're not really interested in packing as many people as we can. And uh, it's more just showing them, you know, here's the technique, here's how we do it, you know, here's uh, how it could you know, benefit your practice. And, um, and also just having a you know good time because we go out to eat and you know, just kind of hang out for the rest of the night and, and then uh, wake up the next day and do some more cases. Yeah, you know, I, I think those type of learning experiences are, are invaluable. I mean, I think, um, you know, learning to play Simplants 101, like you can take that in a big course. But if, if you want to go from good to great and really master your craft, I think like the thing you're talking about is, you know, finding someone who can really show you, uh, you know, behind the curtain, how it's done, all this, all the details, mentor you, one-on-one train you. And I think, I think that's the best way to do that. These higher level procedures. That's how I learned how to do, you know, my advanced grafting techniques and my, you know, procedures. It wasn't through a textbook or a lecture. It was through, you know, one-on-one mentorship, live surgery, over the shoulder type of training. And I think um, that it's great that you're, you're doing that. And, uh, and I'm sure uh, others will want that in the future. So, um, you know, maybe one day I can knock on your door and say, Hey, I'm here for my day of training, uh, you know, but I think I've got, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to get some more cases going, uh, but I'm not ready for that jump yet, but sooner or later. Um, so yeah, that'd, yeah. Be, that'd be great, but I will be, yeah. I will be, I will be pre-ordering that book tonight online. So I'm, I'll be excited for that. I do like the books and I do like the tutorials, but, but like you're saying, there is nothing better than getting your fingers bloody and, and getting in there. Yeah. Basically one thing that I'm doing for the, the folks that are ordering the book, um, uh, are you know we have basically our own little private email list and so i'll be sending out you know cases uh you know just commentary uh you know just kind of showing you know, here's what we did today you know uh you know like for example tomorrow i'm doing a terragoid case so after we do the case you know i'll you know have pictures of it and then i'll do a little write-up about it and send it out to all the members in the group and you know if anyone has questions then you know they can respond back and you know just a little private group of like-minded individuals that can talk shop about you know this one small niche um but uh it you know give you an avenue to you know just get a bit more learning in absolutely you know i started this podcast and this facebook page four years ago because i thought you know what i don't and at the time looking back it's like i was barely doing anything and uh uh you know i thought i i don't know what i'm i'm doing i'm not posting any stuff to actually show like hey look at me this is what i'm doing i just thought i'm just gonna put up cases that i'm doing every day and and if colleagues can uh 
you know, take a peek at it and have an opinion or think about it or post a case they're doing. You know, we all kind of learn from each other. And I, I think that's been neat to see um, that process, kind of like you're looking at. You get to meet people and get and get other other views and opinions you um, you might not otherwise hear. And I think, you know, obviously we're a collection of all the people we interact with and, and have been taught by. And so, you know, I, I think any, any, any place you can get and learn from somebody is, is good. And just talking about cases every day, you're going to get better. Yeah, and that's where, you know, social media has been really nice and and a big change to our profession is, you know, a lot of times people think that you know, people are getting on and posting cases just to show off or, you know, look at me, uh, you know, but really it's, um, I know that there's people out there that, you know, can benefit and I benefit from seeing other people's cases. I mean, I, you know, I've learned all kinds of techniques and tips and, you know, little, uh, uh, you know, I guess tools to have in your bag that, uh, you saw somebody else do cause they took, you know, a couple minutes to take a picture and post it online. And, and, you know, it also allows you to have access to certain people, you know, cause I'll contact certain people and ask them a question. And I have people contact me and ask me a question and, you know, I might be on the computer and you end up having a five minute you know, one-on-one just message session back and forth with them. And, you know, one, you get to know the person and become, you know, uh, a friend with them, whether it's, you know, a, a social media type friend at some point at some of these meetings. But, um, you know, you could have a few minutes and you get some of your questions answered, you know, and uh, it, you know, really benefits everybody because you're able to, you know, everybody has something to share knowledge wise and, you know, you pick up a little bit from this person, you pick up a little bit from that person, and it just, you know, rounds out your knowledge and skill set and just lets you treat your patients better. Yeah. And, and you know, I think we're all in this together. And, and at the end of the day, we just want to treat our patients the best we can. And uh, and I, I'd like to believe that's uh, mostly the case. And uh, I've found that it is. And so I, I love it when I get to meet uh, people. I've met virtually at meetings and, you know, if you go to enough a year, you, you, you pretty much can. So I think that's been great too. You know, you can meet people that you've already kind of built these relationships with and it's been a lot of fun. So, um, I guess that's a good place to cut it for tonight, Dan. I know we've both had long days tonight and both have long days tomorrow. And, um, you know, I will make a point to either, uh, either at some point come down and see you or track you down to meet you in a meeting. Cause, uh, I would love to meet and chat with you a bit. And I know you're busy, but, uh, I'll make a point to track you down. And I, I, uh, like, like I said, really appreciate your time and effort for everything you're doing in implant dentistry, and thanks for your time tonight. Yeah, man, likewise. I look, look forward to meeting you at some point when we get to travel again. <laughs>